Thank you, Tom. Uh, this is how I get all my awards. We're gonna <laughs> it's going to look great on my shelf, Archbishop. Um, I'm really flattered to be, uh, to be asked to stand in for the Archbishop. Um, I have been an admirer of his for several decades. I, I want to say just a word or two about our relationship. And it doesn't really, I mean, it, you all know him for his defense of religious freedom, for his uh, eloquent writings about the place of the Catholic Church and about religion in contemporary American life. But I, I've known him in the first instance as a, as a pastor. He, uh, my sister Annette lives in Denver and uh, he, uh, has for 30 years. Um, she first introduced me to the archbishop when he was her archbishop out there. He baptized uh, several of her kids, and they were they were very close. And uh, that's how I first met him. I had um, a couple of years ago the opportunity to give a uh, speech in Rapid City, South Dakota, and I can't tell you how fondly the people in Rapid City still remember Archbishop Chaput from his time there, much as they love uh, his successor and their. The current Archbishop, he's just, uh, he's the most wonderful pastor. Those of you who may know him as well as I do and have his email address have had the experience of writing to him and getting an answer like that any time of day or night. You think, what? <laughs> how, is, how is he able to do this and, and uh, run the Archdiocese? Um, and in recent, um, in the last year and a half or so, I've been working on something called the Catholic Project about the role of the laity in the Catholic Church. And I have to say, surveying the entirety of the American Catholic Episcopacy, I don't know anybody who has been a better, um, better at cultivating lay participation in what he's done. The list of people like Fran Mayer and Jonathan Reyes and Tim Gray and Jade Hendricks and Carna Lazoya and who have been brought up and given responsibilities by the archbishop is just, um, you know, it's like a, uh, it's like an all-star team of um, uh, the important people and important lay people in American Catholic life. It's always clear to everybody that he's the archbishop, but he trusts people with responsibilities, and I think it's what's made him as successful as he had. So, I'm really flattered to be asked. I, um, I uh, rather than talk about him or give my own speech, I, um, I got a copy of what the Archbishop was going to say tonight. And let me just read that to remind you about why you're giving him this award. Um, I turned 75 in September. This is the Archbishop, not me. I <laughs> <laughs> if you make it to my age, you know yourself and your limitations pretty well. So I have no illusions that I actually earned tonight's award. Tom, Eric, Tim, Kent, and the whole RFI team do profoundly important work. I've admired them for many years. So it's a privilege to call them friends and to encourage all of us to help them in every way we can. George will, uh, uh, I'm sure, give us a wonderful talk, and we don't need two, so this will be brief. It's been said that pessimists are optimists with experience. <laughs> Today, between an eccentric White House and a crop of Democratic candidates with crippled memories of what real socialism actually accomplished in the last century, mass murder, destroyed cultures, and ruined economies, the temptation to pessimism can be strong. The good news is that hope is quite different from optimism, because it's rooted in a God who's outside and greater than ourselves. Hope is a virtue. Like all virtues, it requires a certain amount of courage. Hope casts out fear and enables us to love. And the love of God and of human persons, the virtue of charity, is the animating spirit of all authentically Christian political action. By love, I don't mean love in the soft or indulgent sense. I mean the virtue that's the fullest living out of our religious convictions. The reality of our public life is that Catholics, and I suspect most religious believers in the United States, can live quite peacefully with the separation of our religious structures and authorities from the power of the state. But the arrangement only works if it translates into real religious freedom. Freedom of religion is not simply freedom of worship. A faithful married man is ruled in every aspect of his life, both public and private, by the commitment he makes to his wife. Anything less in his behavior is infidelity and hypocrisy. And the same applies to our relationship with God. 
the state has a legitimate zone of its own authority and service to the community, but no zone of human activity is free from the sovereignty of God. A state without reverence for religion is just another form of idolatry. We can never accept a separation of our religious faith and moral convictions from our public ministries and our political engagement. This, this sort of thing forces us to live schizophrenic lives, worshiping God at home and in our churches or synagogues or mosques, and worshiping the latest version of Caesar everywhere else. This is a convenient moral narcotic, but it has nothing to do with real religious faith. And this schizophrenia, which is now common in our public discourse and our news media, poisons the life of the whole political community. Religious freedom is the cornerstone of a free, honest, and morally vigorous society. We need to fight for it. This is why we need the Religious Freedom Institute and why its service to our nation is so vitally important. So, thanks for your patience in listening tonight. Thanks for the great kindness of this award, and thanks for supporting the RFI. God bless you all.